keep it recording now. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today on the last event in our community development and equity webinar series. And if you missed um, the first two, feel free to reach out to me and I can direct you to the recordings. Um, we are so grateful to have Dr. Akila Watkins here with us today. She is the president and CEO for the Center for Community Progress, America's nonprofit theater for turning vacant spaces into vibrant spaces. A 25 year national thought leader, conference speaker and nonprofit executive, Dr. Watkins work began at the age of 14 when she led efforts to convert a vacant lot and abandoned home into a community center in Roosevelt, New York. Since then, she served as an executive leader for nonprofits and community development initiatives, which include work for the Obama administration, NeighborWorks America, the Ford Foundation, and hundreds of municipalities throughout the US. And today, Dr. Watkins' leadership includes championing work in more than 300 communities in 48 states at Community Progress, working to grow strong, equitable communities where vacant, abandoned, and deteriorated properties are transformed into assets for neighbors and neighborhoods. So with that said, um, the floor is yours. And also um, before we start, if you have any questions that you have right now, please feel <coughs> free to enter them to the chat so Dr. Watkins can address them as she speaks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is an honor for me to be here today and talk to you a little bit about uh, my work and um, a little bit about how we infuse equity into community revitalization efforts. Um, I will invite all of you though, before I get started with some framing comments to put questions into the chat box because I want to answer your questions uh, directly. So, and you know, I know we only have about an hour today and you know, sometimes these conversations um, can, can go on and questions don't always get answered. And so I think um, one of the most important things I wanna do is be able to answer your questions directly and, and dig into areas that um, sometimes I don't really get to dig in much because um, in the capacity that I'm at, I always usually um, have to stay at a very technical level. Um, and so it's really nice, um, at least I, my hope is that we can explore some more theoretical um, aspects to how we do community revitalization. So um, I will um, be checking the um, chat box um, often, but I encourage you all to just post questions, um, things you would like for me to uh, tackle in this talk with you all today. Um, if you read an article um, that you thought was really interesting and you would like me to talk about any kind of um, theme, um, please put that in, in the chat box. I'll also let you know if I can't do it, um, if, if, if it's something that is beyond uh, my, my, my knowledge. Uh, so um, please feel free to, to use that. I also like to introduce Mr. Uh, Michael Bachnovic, um, who um, serves as special assistant um, um, to me, um, but also uh, Mike has just been um, a, a trusted colleague and friend of mine for, for, for many years. So um, he will be, Mike, you're joining, you're gonna stay with us the entire time today, yes. Um, so, and any sort of uh, materials or um, information, um, you know, Mike can make sure to get it out to you all today. We have a lot of resources at the Center for Community Progress, so um, that may be good for you all to read. Um, I also ask that you all do not be shy. I mean, I have uh, um, a you know nice a bit of information. I've served as a, a, a college professor for years um, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, where I taught several classes. Um, in, so, in the sociology department, um, mostly focused on poverty um, and, and also uh, taught at the University of Michigan, um, excuse me, University of Maryland um, for a few years to looking at social stratification. So um, I'm pretty comfortable in an academic setting. So I, I really do look forward to an exchange of, of ideas today and, and encourage you all to to post. Um, so <clears throat> I will um, 
just frame um, some comments. Um, so I serve as president and CEO at the Center uh, for Community Progress, and I have been in this role for three and a half years. And, and so one of the things I would like to uh, focus on in this conversation is not so much like, you know, what I do or, you know, a bio, but really around how do you fuse kind of theory and practice, right, to actually develop some, um, I think, some really winning strategies to revitalize communities and especially communities of color. Um, so just set the stage. Um, we call community progress, national organizations, been around for 10 years, um, was created out of the last housing crisis, um, the mortgage meltdown. Um, it was created as a way to help uh, local governments take more control of their vacant and abandoned properties. We all know millions of properties um, became abandoned because millions of families lost their homes and consequentially, and cons uh, consequentially um, lost their wealth. And so um, the community progress was set up as an answer to that. Um, how can communities take more control over their land resources? How can uh, families' wealth be uh, preserved? Um, we know that the mortgage crisis hit um, predominantly black and brown communities very hard. And we also understand, um, for example, that African-American communities lost more than $9 trillion in wealth that they have still not recaptured after the, the mortgage uh, crisis. So uh, our organization played a very pivotal role um, before the creation of Community Progress 10 years ago. There was no um, organization able to um, help at a national level, help local governments begin to really um, um, aggregate their, um, their learning, their challenges, and, and more importantly, what are they gonna do with all this vacant and abandoned property? Um, <clears throat> so our work has really been, um, and so let me just tell you what, we're, what we don't do. Like we don't have, we don't own the properties um, as a national organization. Um, we have been the largest champion for something called a land bank. Um, land banks were created um, in 1991, um, and and as and as of today, there are close to about 200 land banks in the country. And so, land banks are quasi-government organizations that are usually created with some sort of um, state enabling legislation that help uh, local governments be able to uh, acquire. Um, hold and dispose of land um, in a way that can promote the best and highest use uh, for communities. Um, it's also a way to clean a lot of the um, back taxes that a lot of these vacant um, properties have acquired over the years. Um, it's also a way to get um, um, a clean deed. And um, all these things are, are um, deeply essential when we think about um, how we revitalize communities, especially those communities that, um, you know, have had some challenges with equity issues, right? So equity is the value um, of your, of your um, property. That's how we're using equity in this, not racial equity, but equity in terms of the financial equity of your home. So how much value does your, um, does your home actually have? Um, and so when we think about a lot of the, the small and mid-sized cities across America, which is really our sweet spot as an organization, um, what we begin to see is that after the mortgage meltdown crisis of the 2008s, um, a lot of these cities never really recovered and equity, um, the value of your home, actually it became, um, it started to, to decline. Um, and, and so we needed a strategy to really help cities be able to go in there and um, be able to stop um, the declining um, equity um, taking place, but also figure out what are they gonna do with all this um, vacant um, property that now um, many cities owned. <clears throat> so um, the Center for Community Progress, again, played a very pivotal role um, in that. 
we are we provide a lot of technical assistance to land banks across the across the country. Um, while we did not create land banks, land banks existed before the creation of community progress. We helped to accelerate them. And so a lot of our work is really around how do we provide technical assistance to emerging and new um, um, burgeoning land banks, but also how do we strengthen those that are, um, already exist. Um, I did start out by saying land banks are quasi-government organizations. What that means is that um, they do have a lot of um, powers where anybody that has the power to extinguish back taxes has a lot of power, um, uh, entities that can do that. Um, so it has to be created, um, use, again, at, usually with state enabling legislation. It does, an, um, a 501c3 nonprofit can't just jump up and say, hey, we are going to be a land bank. Land banks are a very specific designation. Um, <clears throat> and it's also quasi-government because it's um, transparent, um, because land banks have to utilize a certain level of um, public trust and public dollars. Um, the, the actual actions and decisions of land banks are transparent to residents of a particular locale. And so, um, we um that's another reason why we really have spent so much of our time as an organization providing just really good high quality capacity building for land banks um, because we want to make sure that they are doing um doing good work across the across the country um so that's a that's a bit about land banks um and i'm more than happy um to answer additional questions about what they are but um you know, again, in terms of the role that they um, play in revitalizing communities, we think it's we think it's an important role. Um, one is that if land banks don't exist, and we and we do have counterfactual data to um, back up this claim, what we begin to see is that we see a lot of um, you know private equity firms coming into um, many cities and being able to just buy up large swaths of homes and properties and you know to be honest with you we do not want to see large equity firms do that um, partly because um, those owners don't live in the community um, and and therefore do not have a daily stake in 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 what works for the community and what doesn't uh, 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 two, usually the, the private equity firms have no kind of deep commitment to the community. And so what then happens is that a lot of those properties that they uh, acquire um, actually become detrimental to the community in a year, two years. Um, they become almost like a revolving um, uh, door for low income, for low income residents. We don't, and I want to be clear, we don't think that all um, um, non-land bank owners are bad. Um, but what we have seen is that the large equity firms, many of them um, do not start out with the community's best interest at heart. And, and, and they do not have the, um, the mandate on transparency and the mandate to provide um, um, or to think about the community's best interest. It's not part of their mandate. Their mandate is to make money. And, and that is another fundamental difference between um, why land banks play such a pivotal role. Um, it is because land banks uh, making money is secondary um, to meeting the community's land use needs. It's not primary. Um, so we, you know, um, so we do think our role, um, is important. We do a lot of other things other than land banks, but I'm, I'm just drilling in on that because it's, you know, um, I know that may be of interest to, to many of you about what it is, what it does. Um, and so we, you know, one other thing I will say is we have seen, um, a, a huge growth in land banks again in 1991, when they started, it were four. Um, and today they're close to 200. Um, we are seeing a lot more land banks take place in, um, 
in more kind of southeast rural parts of the country, which is a very big difference from where they started from, which is more of the kind of industrial um, Midwest. And, and so um, places where we've seen huge um, or aging housing stock, right? Um, you can imagine. Um, so, you know, we think that's a really, um, a really interesting phenomena. Um, the, the vast majority of land banks are still taking place east of the Mississippi River. Uh, we, however, though, we are seeing more and more land banks um, in, popping up all over, all over the uh, country. And when I mean pop up, meaning that they have been through some level of state enabling legislation um, um, and, and have put the necessary steps um, in place. Um, and again, you know, I will point out two things that may be of interest to you all. One is that um, we're doing a lot of work in Houston um, right now, um, part, and, and partly because what, what we are seeing is that before we saw the mortgage meltdown, and that's part of, and that's a huge reason that drove land bank kind of cultivation and development. Today we're seeing, um, a lot of natural disasters driving kind of land bank growth and development. Um, you know, a lot of cities are, you know, that are coastal cities like Houston, uh, Puerto Rico, which we're doing a lot of work in Puerto Rico too. Part of um, what we have seen is that as, um, as more natural disasters are taking place, um, we are seeing um, cities now being inundated almost overnight with, with huge amounts of vacant and abandoned property. And so the difference in how we are um, really, I, I think being more strategic, but also um, centering equity is that land banks are in no way, um, you know, we don't want to assume anybody's property. Um, so what we are doing is though setting up um, or working to set up temporary land banks where families can actually just um, deposit their properties there for a certain amount of time um, because as a natural disaster happens, people have to flee. Um, however, though, when they come back, they can um, they can acquire their property back. If we don't do that though, what, what happens and what we're seeing in places like Puerto Rico in particular um, is that um, large, again, these large kind of equity um, firms are coming in and acquiring these vacant and abandoned properties for almost nothing because people leave, they, they leave to save their lives. And, and they sometimes it's hard for them to come back or get back, um, you know, um, I, I, I don't want to say in time because in time for who, right? But it's hard for them to get back um, um, sometimes. And, and so, um, Land banks can be a great way for property um, to be able to be held um, um, while families are able to, are, need to collect their lives. Um, and so and it can also protect against huge equity firms coming in and kind of like just gobbling up land. Um, we've seen this, um, especially in places um, like Puerto Rico. Um, we've also seen in places like Puerto Rico too that um, less than uh, about 40% of properties on the island are owned straight up, right? Like there's a clean deed. And I keep re referencing this whole concept of, the, of a clean deed, partly because in order to get any sort of kind of federal assistance once a natural disaster happens, you have to have a clean deed because that's how the federal government knows exactly who to make a payment to, um, who to send any sort of, um, um, you know, assistance um, to. And, and, and in many communities of color, that's just not, you know, how we've done, um, you know, land rights, right? Um, there, there may be eight people that live in the house and that are taking care of the home. Um, <clears throat> a grandmother may have passed and um, her grandchildren or her own children may have assumed um, that property. And so who gets then, you know, um, who, who does FEMA work with then, right? So, um, you know, we've, 
done some work, especially when we um, in places like New Orleans and, and such around really kind of untangling and helping families kind of like designate, um, you know, and, and get a clean deed so they can be able to get access to federal resources. Um, and, and so, you know, I, you know, what, I guess what I'm trying to paint a picture of is that, you know, when we started this work, um, you know, we thought this would work and so, you know, we thought we were going to be working with vacant and abandoned interior properties. And, and what, and what you begin to see is that every, um, challenge you try to, uh, solve, um, uh, is very layered, right? And so it's not, it's not simple. Um, and, and so, yeah, um, we work on land banks is one thing we do. And then we get into natural disasters and now we're getting into like, um, you know, who owns property and, and how do we work across um, challenges around how um, familial, how different familial um, contexts are set up um, based on, um, you know, um, how um, different people of color, um, in particular, like set up their families, right, and, and set up, you know, property rights in their particular families. And how does square to what the federal government um, is willing to recognize, right? So everything kind of leads to, to more questions, more work, more thinking, um, and leads to very complex um, complex problem solving, right? Um, and, and so, um, so anyway, um, those are just some ideas of, you know, how we do what we do and 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 to the point around how equity plays into this i mean i i've tried to 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 weave it in it's it's not a standalone thing um so much of our work at the center is around um reparative work for communities of color um we know that and we've done this as a practice we have looked at redlining maps, um, and I'm assuming everybody in here knows what redlining is. Uh, well, we've looked at redlining maps, and we've also overlaid it where, um, with where there are high rates of vacancy abandonment in a particular community. And what we have found is that those maps coincide um, too neatly, too nicely. So we, what we've seen is that. Um, History, um, a history of housing um, dis um, discrimination. Um, the outgrowth of that is um, what we see today in terms of huge amounts of vacancy and abandonment. And what that means in terms of how that deeply impacts the uh, economic resources of community, right? Um, what does that do psychologically for the people that live there? Right. Um, nobody wants to walk past a, a vacant or abandoned building their their lives, you know, in their community. They don't want to do that. And so um, what does that mean in terms of crime? Right. Because um, what we've seen is that um, a lot of just illicit and naughty behavior takes place in um, vacant and abandoned and deteriorated buildings. Um, and, 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 you know, we have to hear from police chiefs wide and wide and far about the challenges that, that take place in the little bit of resources that they do have. Um, nobody wants to live in a community or to live next to a vacant, um, and abandoned, um, building. The other thing that um, also is a consequence of this is declining home values. You know, we know that the closer you live to a vacant uh, building and I'm, you know, and within like, um, like 500 feet or within, you know, a thousand feet that your property values decline. Right. And so, and we know that the vast majority of Americans hold their wealth in their homes. And so when you're talking about um, especially African American and Latinx communities that um, overwhelmingly are deeply impacted by vacancy and abandonment, you know, we do not need their properties um, 
to to be declining at all because we already have a huge challenge in this country with um, with home price equity, right? Um, there was a recent article, um, Michael, I don't know if it was a New York Times that looked at the various, um, you know, how a black homeowner and a white homeowner, um, and it was actually the same house because it was a biracial couple, um, actually their home, um, the value of their home is different depending on who actually lives there. Well, the value of your home is actually different based on who lives there, but also where that house is located. And so you can have a beautiful home, the same home. Um, so wait, I'll give you a clear example. I live in Prince George's County. Um, Prince George's County is the wealthiest African-American county in the country. Um, however, though, with all that wealth, um, in the county. My home in Prince George's County, I have the same home that's in Howard County. Howard County is up the road from us um, in Prince George's. It is $300,000 difference. Be I, I mean, I literally got the same house. I mean, no, the same builder built it. The same materials went in it. And I literally, in fact, my property was bigger. I'm actually, it was on a bigger property. Uh, but because my, and I'm closer to DC, <laughs> I'm closer to a bigger metropolitan area, but because I, I live in um, um, Prince George's County, which is a predominantly African-American county, I lose about $300,000 worth of equity on my house. And, and, and so we know that our work at the center um, for community progress is extremely important because it is reparative um, it, it does help to right historical wrongs. Um, and, um, and it also helps to create, or it helps, it helps to strengthen a sense of efficacy among local residents. Like, what do they do now with land? Like, how can they reimagine how land gets used in their communities? Um, we do a lot of work at the center to help um, educate residents about how to be informed consumers of, um, of housing and development data in their respective communities. Like, you know, you know, how do they go to their zoning board and know what's going on? Like, how do you, you know, how do you discover who, what developer is actually going to be building in your respective community? Um, you know, how do you, how do you advocate it in their own community in that work? So it's really, really important and plays a pivotal, pivotal role, um, we think, in the revitalization of, of space and place. And so, um, it is about 2.30 now, and I really want to make sure that I capture, okay, good. I really want to make sure that I capture some of these questions, but those are just some of my, my framing. Um, I'm being a part of the whole future development. So Ashley, that's a great question. Um, so what land banks do, okay, so if you could read Ashley's, I'll read it. Ashley wanted to know, uh, what does the land bank do about land home holders that allow blight and abandoned properties as a holding for future development. Yeah, that's not what we promote as um, land banks generally promote. So if there is um, a landowner that um, wants to hold property because they know in five or 10 years that it's going to turn over, um, <laughs> what we also work on is a lot of code enforcement, right? that code enforcement is a way that cities can make sure that landowners are being responsible, right? That they can't, um, you know, uh, basically abdicate their responsibility with their properties because of some future payoff uh, that no. So code enforcement is um, a way that local governments can be able to hold um, landlords responsible to make sure that whatever dwelling that they have on that property is kept up to date, that is, it's not harmful to who, um, whoever lives there, um, to the neighbors, that the grass is being cut, um, 
that the brush the uh, and trees on it are appropriately being maintained. So code enforcement is very important. I mean, we do a lot of work um, with local governments around um, equitable code enforcement. You know, what we don't want to happen is look, we know home maintenance is very expensive, especially for older homes. So we don't want like um, little old ladies <laughs> getting, um, um, you know, um, disproportionately um, held liable um, or criminal, criminally held liable um, because they're, not, they're just not in a financial position to keep their home up. Um, and so we've been working with a lot of jurisdictions around that. Um, but what we don't want is we don't want people to skate free and not um, really, you know, um, keep their properties, properties up. You know, the, let me just say this too. Uh, there are a lot of, there's some bad actors out there, <laughs> you know, in terms of uh, property maintenance, bad actors. And so what we have seen is that, um, is that as the housing market gets a lot more competitive, that um, middle-class families that would traditionally be homeowners now become renters. Right. And so everybody gets pushed down a couple of rungs because we haven't done the best job with keeping up with demand in this country in terms of providing like housing. Like I, I, we, I would love to say affordable housing, but we haven't even done a great job of keeping up with housing. Um, and so um, as populations grow, as city centers grow, we need more housing. And, and we need different types of housing. And so everybody now gets pushed down. Everybody now gets pushed down. And so for, for bad actors that feel like they can exploit people that are poor or low income and that are vulnerable, that's not a good, that, that, those are the things that we are trying to prevent. Those are, those are the people that we are trying to fight against. Um, so, um, and a lot of families um, are living in substandard housing as we speak, you know, and that is housing that is not adequate for children, not adequate for anyone, to be honest with you. Um, and so um, as we are going into the winter months um, and, we're and we're deeply into um, a moratorium on, um, on evictions in this country, um, and we needed it. We need to be at a moratorium because of what um, COVID has done to the economy. What we are seeing is that a lot of these bad actors are not, you know, um, making sure that these properties are really um, able to house children, families, that sort of thing. And I'm more than happy to talk about the complexity of what that means. Um, but code enforcement is one way that we can fight this and making sure that people aren't just holding property and not being responsible to their neighbors. And, and fundamentally, I think that that's the point that I, if I, if I don't get anything across to you today, um, I want to get this point across to you, is that in order to have viable communities, viable just does not mean money. It does mean money. Yeah, I want to be clear. But it also means a sense of community, right? A sense of shared values, a sense of togetherness, um, a sense of um, some sort of like linked fate, right? And so that is what it looks like when we're when um, when community is clicking and it's clicking on all cylinders. It looks like we're all working together and we all have this sense of linked fate. And so where you decide to spend, um, live and invest and buy a home and volunteer and vote and send your children to school is gonna be one of the most important things you do in your life. And so, and you all are in an extremely um, privileged position because you're gonna do that out of choice. But so many people do not have that choice. 
so many people have to kind of get in where they fit in, right? So they have to go to places where their money can take them. And if they do not have a lot of money, then those choices become um, very few and far in between. And so what we are trying to do here at the center and others in the field of community development more broadly is to make sure that people can live in communities of choice, of opportunity. Um, and so I think that was a great question, Ashley. Um, and let me Kula, see, if, am I missing? Kila, I just wanted to Mike? share really quickly. I dropped a few links for the audience in the chat. Uh, touching on your consideration of inequity and in home values. There are yeah. too many examples, quite frankly. And as you touched on Aquila, the um, interplay between historic redlining maps and what we see today can be seen in cities like Chicago, DC, et cetera. Um, but also Ashley's question touched on this conundrum of vacancy issues while there are housing shortfalls. And that seems like a disconnect, right? And so, you know, Akila, I think that your point a moment ago about the complexity of these issues and how we approach them in an equitable fashion is something to really take to heart. Yeah, and, and th it does seem like, <laughs> like it should be solvable. Like, you know what, we need housing and we have a bunch of vacant property, like, let's just do this. And, you know, part of the fundamental challenge um, is that as a society, we have not internalized this idea that housing is a right and not a privilege. We have not done that. Like, a, like just good quality housing is a right. Um, I still think we function very much as though it's a privilege. Um, and when we think about um, our finance mechanisms, when I think about um, how we incentivize things through our tax system, um, it, it's, we, I mean, when we think about um, the voucher system here, the housing voucher system here um, in America, um, that one in five people that need a housing voucher gets it. That means four out of five don't, you know? <laughs> um, like that means four out of five people just got to get in and figure out a way to like find housing, you know? Um, so we haven't, we have not as a society fundamentally decided that housing should be a right. And nothing keeps me up at night more than that, right? So, um, and we need to really um, make that shift, right? So um, I've spent, you know, this week has been really exciting because of the election and, you know, um, and, you know, it's new energy coming into the White House and the country. But, you know, I had a meeting earlier this week with the Biden-Harris transition team. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, what some of the message or narrative shifts we would like to see the new HUD secretary engage with and or Biden, right? And, and you know, everybody had all this stuff about, you know, all the things they want Biden to be saying at the mic. My whole thing is that if we can shift Americans to, to believe that housing should be a right, I think, my God, like we, I mean, when I tell you that would be like groundbreaking. The same way we need to shift when we think about healthcare, healthcare being a right. I think COVID has showed us all um, in a deeply profound way that we can't, we can't, um, we no longer can other each other, right? We can't, um, we cannot other each other. We can't say, well, you're, you know, you're poor, you're black, you're, you're over there and I'm not, you know, because COVID has showed us, um, in a very clear way that we are deeply connected, that 
um, we can't escape um, the reality of each other's lives. We can't do it. We can't do it. And so um, I, I hope that housing, I hope, um, and I think we are at this very kind of interesting point now and, and, and what COVID has done, like COVID has amplified just a lot of stuff. But one thing COVID has amplified is this need for high quality housing with people having to literally be on lockdown for what will be close to a year um, once the vaccine, you know, makes it to like the kind of um, main street um, that, you know, quality housing is so important um, um, because it is, I mean, in so many ways it saves lives, it keeps people healthy, you know, um, I mean, it becomes a respite. Um, I think we are at a very pivotal point in our, um, in our evolution as a field to really amplify the importance of housing um, now and, and to amplify it in a way that people understand how fundamental it is and how much we have to make sure that everyone has this right. Because if they don't, then I think we damn ourselves to what COVID has showed us which is that we're deeply connected. Um, and that, you know, if we don't take care of our neighbors, if we don't take care of our citizens, then that, you know, we're going to be um, adversely impacted. So, um, you know, that's just my hope, you know, um, and, but we'll, you know, we'll see how it, how it plays out, so. I want to make sure that I am quiet and and be able to answer any questions that people do have of me, um, or the or the field in in general. Any questions? Please feel free to unmute and ask your question if you want. And we have one more question in the chat that just came up. Okay, okay. Discussion on the roll. Uh, okay, so this one is about demolition. And I implore everybody to read it. Go into it and be on about the role. Yeah, no, this is a really good question, Chris. Um, so demolition is one tool in revitalization, and I will I will say that. Um, so there's some cities that have overly used demolition. And so what some cities have done is basically torn down all of its like aging housing stock and basically um, created like almost like vast fields of just empty vacant land. Um, and, and there are some critics of this because there are those who feel like, you know, should we have looked at doing more kind of renovation? Should we um, look at other alternatives such as may, um, as increasing kind of lot size of those residents that are, you know, still there? Um, and, and so I, you know, my whole take on this is that I think it, it just depends. I do think demolition needs to be a tool. I think in places like Detroit, where the city was just massive, the city was massive. And as populations of Wayne County has decreased, I do think that the city, um, because of its own bottom line, had to kind of shrink itself. Um, now, I, I wish that, um, you know, maybe some of those conversations could have been a lot more strategic um, that we, you know, so what happened in Wayne County is because the city is so massive um, and as neighborhoods started to empty out, uh, we may have had one or two neighbors still living on a block, but the block was basically empty, but like two neighbors were there and it would cost like millions of dollars for the city to like keep street lights on, right? Um, and, and so what the city has done is relocated people to um, bringing them more kind of closely um, to the uh, center of the city and then usually demolish those homes and almost created like a 
inner city wilderness. Like it's, you know, if you if you drive through parts of Detroit, you just can't believe it. Like you would, I mean, um, but I don't think it needs to be overused um, at all, Chris. I don't think um, demolition needs to be overused. I do think that we need to figure out uh, migration patterns where people are moving, where, where are the resources at the transportation, the supermarkets, those institutions that keep communities viable and then make sure that people can populate around those. And in some cases, it may make sense to shrink a city. Um, but I also think in places like um, a Detroit who's, who's done this um, um, and has over, probably overused uh, demolition that we also think really smartly ar around what we do with those properties. Um, what we have done is we've helped to change some of the zoning of those uh, now demolished kind of more um, open vacant properties um, and really looked at some uh, more agricultural businesses um, that may benefit from you know having kind of larger swaths of land within the city limits of the of a detroit um and so we we've used that as an economic development opportunity um for cities um as opposed to kind of just letting it lay bare and for for that land to kind of basically go back to nature. So we, I mean, that's some of the strategies we have in, um, employed um, with cities that have that have done that. But our work in places like Toledo, um, you know, is to not overuse um, demolition. Um, a demolition is, ex you know, it's expensive too. Um, and two, it can destabilize a community um, if it's, you know, overly used. Um, and so we, we really want to just, just, just be as strategic and smart as possible, um, especially when we're talking about some of those kind of middle, those like middle city um, neighborhoods that are like within the city, right? Not the outskirts of it. So, um, that's a little bit about at least my thinking about demolition, but I and you know Michael, we may want to share some of our reporting that we have on our website about um, demolition, so you can read some of at least our case studies um, about some of the lessons that we've learned about that. Yeah, we uh, we did drop our recent report for the state of Michigan in the chat box. Um, mm -hmm. Keila touched on an important point, which is to think strategically, because sometimes demolition is the right action, especially when there is such widespread conditions, uh, especially of very deteriorated properties. In many cases, uh, that can actually be an opportunity for completely new construction. Um, Akila, we also got a great question about how land banks and land trusts are working together, and, and that's something we know a lot about. Uh, maybe you could touch on that. Yep, absolutely. So um, a community land trust is um, a, a nonprofit organization um, that is created to provide long term um, affordable housing. Um, and, and how community land trusts work is that they actually own the ground rights to um, land. And usually the, the, the ground rights, they may have a 99 year lease on, on the ground and actual families um, buy the actual dwelling that's on, the, um, on that property. Um, and, and so by doing that, by the land being owned by the community land trust, they're able in, um, in a lot of ways to manage um, the, the kind of price growth that happens that sometimes can price a family out um, over um, a few years because they want to do perpetual kind of affordable housing. They want to make sure that that property can stay affordable for many, many families to come. The families that do buy community land trust are able to acquire equity. Um, they they don't, I mean, so the equity um, generates, it doesn't generate the same way it does for like just the kind of regular uh, market, but it still generates and, and families that buy a, um, into a community land trust um, usually stay there for no more than seven years. And then they 
kind of go into like the not the normal kind of housing market afterward. So it's a great on ramp for families, and they do and that equity that they acquire through their time at the community land trust serves as a down payment and a wealth creation for those families. Um, community land banks and land trusts uh, do work together. Um, Community land, land banks have traditionally worked in very weak markets. However, though, we are seeing more community land uh, banks work in more moderate and stronger markets, where community land trusts have traditionally worked in stronger and now more moderate markets. <clears throat> community land banks and land trusts become really good partners because land banks are able to acquire uh, land at um, very reasonable or almost transactional cost. Um, be, you know, any land that is um, abandoned, vacant. And then community land trusts are able then to um, save on the land acquisition cost, even though that land will go into the community land trust. Um, but instead of paying like $150,000 to acquire land, now you, you literally are paying you know, maybe 20,000, 15,000, I'm just making, you know, but it, but the, but the, just the difference of what you would pay if you work with a community land bank versus when you don't work with a community land bank, that th then those savings could be passed on to the um, future homeowners, right? Um, now I love, I really do love community um, land uh, trust. And, and let me just say this, I love the history of it too. Um, I serve as the chair of Grounded Solutions Network. That is the national preeminent organization for the country's community land trust. Um, I um, had the honor of going to Albany, uh, Georgia, uh, where the first community land trust was created. Um, it was created as, as um, as part of the outgrowth of the civil rights movement um, as a way for uh, black farmers in Albany to take control of a plantation um, that once um, housed African slaves. Um, and so I got an opportunity to um, visit the, the first community land trust um, in the country. Um, and, and today community, you know, there um, are over 200 and, and so land trust in the, in the country, 250 land trust in the country. Um, and so that movement has grown tremendously and it's really this, like this very kind of grassroots movement that has become super sophisticated now. Um, and, and there, and, you know, um, and they house more than 255,000 um, housing units. Um, the goal is to increase the amount of families who have access to community land trust um, to a million dollars, uh, to a million families over the next decade. Um, so that's very, very doable. Um, there are a few places where community land, I mean, well, you know, community land uh, banks and land trust are working together um, very closely. Um, Houston is one of those places. Um, um, and um, Portland, Oregon is another city we are doing some piloting work in. Albany, New York is one of the, the pioneers of, of this, which we're really um, excited about um, their work. And then Atlanta, Georgia, um, we're seeing a lot more community land banks and land trusts work together and we're doing a lot of work to provide capacity building um, um, to help foster those relationships. Because with community land banks owning the property um, and acquiring the property and then transferring that property to community land trust, we just think that's just an exciting um, opportunity. Um, is there actually a document about the... Oh, okay. Really just, uh, I was just sharing a few more links for people if you're interested. There's a great documentary about that Albany Land Trust, uh, as Dr. Watkins shared. Um, we did get a specific question, Akilah, uh, about the Northeast. Any trends or things that you're looking at in the region where you know many of our participants are at today? Yeah, so really quick, some of the trends that we're seeing is that people are leaving the cities and 
they are moving to um, um, a lot more rural, um, a lot more low density areas that land banks have traditionally occupied. Um, and what we are seeing is that um, a lot of the kind of coastal cities um, um, residents are driving up the housing prices in those areas. And so indigenous residents of those areas are struggling even more because, you know, with an influx of people coming from larger cities with Northeast salaries, um, it's driving up housing prices, it's driving up food costs, it's driving up this, it's driving up that. Um, and, and so that is a trend that we are seeing. Um, and we don't know how long this trend will last. Um, we don't, and we're still trying to figure out, you know, how we strategize and help low-income residents that are, um, in, you know, in and around these cities that are being deeply impacted. Like, what are they going to do in terms of housing, um, housing costs? So that is one of the, um, I want to say, unfortunate trends that that is happening as a result of COVID especially, um, I mean, it's, it's not, I mean, it's happening in the Northeast. I mean, I'm, exp I mean, we're, we're really hearing about this, like a lot. If you think about places like Boston and such, um, it may be happening in places like Connecticut, but it's definitely happening in like New York city. Like so many people are moving upstate New York now. Um, so we, you know, we, we are noticing that, that trend, um, a lot. I know we have about two minutes left. Um, again, I want to thank you all. Um, I want to thank my host um, for inviting me um, today. I had um, an amazing time talking to you all. Um, I hope you find those resources that Michael shared helpful. And uh, I look forward to, um, you know, again, any kind of questions, next steps, thoughts, I look forward to them all. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, we do have like one minute if anyone has one last burning question. Otherwise, we are, you know, almost at time. But thank you so much. Again, so many things to think about. Wow. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the week. And oh, also, Michael, thank you so much for all the resources. They're extremely informative, too. You're very welcome, Eugene. Thank you again for the invitation. Uh, this was wonderful. I just wanted to share if there's anything else you're interested in exploring, check out our website, communityprogress.net. We've got a tremendous library of work from our last 10 years. And uh, Akila uh, didn't go into too much about what our future work is doing, but we've got some awesome stuff on the horizon um, that, that she is spearheading uh, as our president. So. I uh, encourage you, as Akila just dropped in the chat, uh, follow her on social media too. Uh, we're always cooking up some good stuff in DC, as crazy as times may be. <laughs> so, uh, you know, definitely feel free to reach out and, uh, and let us know if we can give you any other support. Yeah, yes. really, really looking forward to all of your work. <laughs> all right, well, take care everyone. Thank you for joining once again.